Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to ANOVA's Ask the Expert lecture on colorectal disease with Dr. Christina Chang and Dr. Nitin Sardana. Dr. Sardana is board certified in gastroenterology. His expertise includes aspects of inpatient and outpatient digestive diseases, disorders, and conditions. Dr. Chang is a board certified colorectal surgeon. She is trained extensively in advanced laparoscopic procedures, including minimally invasive surgery and robotic surgery. Dr. Chang, Dr. Sadana, thank you for joining us tonight. We look forward to a great night of learning. Both doctors will give short presentations on their areas of expertise, and then we will open the floor to questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin, for that introduction. Uh, thank you to our audience members, uh, to Dr. Chang uh, for joining uh, in this talk as well, and especially to Nova for hosting this event, which I believe is very important. Um, just to give you a little bit more background about myself, as Kylan mentioned, I'm a board certified uh, uh, gastroenterologist practicing at the Gastroenterology Associates of Northern Virginia. I'm originally from the DC metropolitan area, uh, growing up in Maryland. I completed my residency uh, at GW and my chief resident year uh, as well at GW and my fellowship at Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh. I did practice for a couple of years in Maryland before joining this practice and I'm very excited to be part of the NOVA family. Right, so the title of our talk today is uh, Staying Ahead of Colorectal Disease. And we say very specifically staying ahead uh, because over the last few decades we have done a better job in detecting colon cancer but it's really important to stay ahead of colon cancer. Now, I won't burden you today with too many graphics or numbers, but this is an important one to start with. As you can see, uh, over the last few decades, the numbers of cases of colorectal disease and deaths are decreasing. Uh, these decreases are largely due to improved screening rates and changes in exposure to risk factors. That being said, to stay ahead, we still have work to do because as you can see, uh, colorectal cancer is still the fourth most common diagnosed cancer in adults and is the second leading cause of death. Uh, in 2014, the CDC indicated that somewhere about 65% of patients over 50 were up to date with their colorectal cancer screening, while a little bit more than 25% had never been screened. In order to stay ahead of colorectal cancer, we have to start at the root of the problem. Specifically, that means st staying ahead of polyps. Now, when we hear polyps, you know, there are a few questions that, that come up. The first question is, what are polyps? Uh, the simplest way to define polyps is that they're abnormal growths of tissue in the colon. Um, if polyps are left in the colon for too long, they can grow into cancer. Now, polyps are fairly common with between 20 and 30% of people over the age of 50 developing polyps. This is a little bit on the lower, towards the lower end for women and a little bit higher for men. Now the vast majority of polyps can, remove, can be removed at the time of your colonoscopy. Now the other problem with polyps is that they are precursors to cancer and the natural history of polyps is that they grow and as polyps grow, there's an increased likelihood that they will turn into cancer. Now when we think of polyps and we think of you know, colon polyps and colon cancer, the first thing we think of is, I, I imagine or I feel like I would have symptoms. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Most, pa most patients with colon polyps do not have symptoms at all. Now, unfortunately, the lack of symptoms, again, may also apply to patients with colon cancer, which is why it's so important to screen individuals for polyps and cancer. You know, as a gastroenterologist, unfortunately, I've seen patients at both ends of the spectrum, some patients with no symptoms at all and some patients with very severe symptoms. Um, before we go on to talk about what types of tests we have to screen for individuals and when to test them, uh, it's important to note that it's a very different scenario if you do have symptoms. Um, we may need to perform diagnostic testing such as colonoscopy in individuals with symptoms such as rectal bleeding, a change in bowel habits, or unexplained weight loss. Now certainly only a small proportion of those patients will have symptoms be, doing, be due to colon cancer, though these are some of the red flag symptoms that do require further evaluation. The next question that comes up now that we know what polyps are 
and that they can grow into cancer is how do we find them? And there are a few options that, uh, that we can use to screen for colon cancer, each with its uh, own pros and cons. And I've listed uh, the most commonly performed test and the test with the highest benefit here, and we'll discuss, discuss each of them in more detail. Uh, for most patients, the colonoscopy experience as a whole is actually much better than they anticipate. Here are a couple of people you may recognize. Uh, here's Katie, uh, Katie Couric and Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, some of you rem remember around the year 2000, Katie Couric had a colonoscopy on the Today Show. Uh, and she had very little sedation and gave a running commentary during the procedure. And there was a temporary uptake in the percent of uh, people who had colonoscopies after uh, she had the colonoscopy on air. And that just shows that increasing awareness of this preventable disease is very important. Now this time last year, uh, Jimmy Kimmel had his first colonoscopy, and as you can tell from this picture, uh, it looks like he had a pretty good experience. <clears throat> now in medicine, before we do any procedure, it's critical to obtain informed consent from our patients. And that means that they understand the risks and benefits of any potential procedure. Uh, fortunately for colonoscopies, all the risks are extremely low. Uh, I've, risked, I've listed the risks here, but they include infection, uh, bleeding, uh, something called a perforation or a hole in the colon or intestinal tract, and that could require surgery. Now, fortunately, that risk is extraordinarily low. That risk is less than one in a thousand. Uh, there are other risks, including, including miss, missing lesions, uh, and injury to surrounding organs, and then there's also risks related to anesthesia, though again, by and large, these risks are extremely low. Now the next uh, important topic to talk about is the prep and how to prepare for a colonoscopy. Um, now unfortunately, the, the word of mouth is true. The prep is probably the most difficult part of the procedure. Um, now there are two, com two key components to what we refer to as the prep. Uh, one, and these are done to optimize visualization of the colon. Uh, the first step is to prevent the colon from making more stool. And the way we do that is only giving you a liquid diet or usually the day before the procedure, occasionally two days before the procedure. The other uh, part of the uh, prep is to clear out the stool from the colon. And to do that, we give you prescription laxatives to essentially flush out all of the stool so that we can see with our uh, scope during the procedure. Uh, sometimes the question about can I take pills comes up. Now, unfortunately, the pills do not work quite as well as the uh, prescription laxatives. Uh, and there are some potential risks of electrolyte uh, imbalance with the pills. Now fortunately over the years, the, the quantity and the timing of the PrEP solutions have changed and all for the better. Uh, Kitty Couric had to drink a, a big gallon, which was pretty commonplace uh, earlier in the uh, millennium. And now, as you can see, Jimmy Kimmel is drinking his the first half of his prep. So the quantities are significantly less than they were before. Uh, on average, they were about a gallon. Now they're about a quarter to even less than that uh, with certain preps. <clears throat> now by the time you show up for your procedure, your hard work is done. Um, the prep, again, is, is for a lar large number of patients the most difficult part about the procedure. Uh, the morning of the procedure, you meet with our anesthesiologist, you get an IV, and the next thing you know, you're in the recovery room. Um, you know, anecdotally, I can say that the first question that a lot of patients ask me in the recovery room is, you know, when are we going to start this colonoscopy? And we're already done. Now, as far as the procedure itself, uh, as most of you know, the instrument that we uh, use is called a scope or colonoscope. Uh, it has a light and a channel for devices that aid in the removal, removal of polyps. Uh, now, as far as the procedure itself, it is considered a painless procedure, and that's even if we do remove colon polyps. Uh, there are no nerve endings for pain in the lining of the colon. Uh, at worst, some patients might feel a little bit of bloating from the air or gas that we insert at the time of the procedure. Uh, however, nowadays, we actually are able to minimize that given the type of gas that we insert. Uh, the procedure uh, involves advancing the scope starting at the end of the colon uh, and advancing it to the beginning. Now, not all colonoscopies are uh, created equal. Uh, a couple of key factors in determining uh, a quality exam include how well your colon is cleaned, and that's why we talk, uh, started by talking about the prep for the exam. 
uh, as well as how much time your physician is taking to take a look at the colon. Uh, and um, again, that's a, that's a key factor in determining if you will find polyps. Uh, in total, the procedure itself can take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. So overall, it is a very quick procedure. Now, as far as polyp removal, I did touch on this before, but polyp removal is generally considered very safe and painless. Uh, there are only very rare occasions when a polyp is too large to be removed, uh, either at that time or even later, in which alternatives will be discussed. And uh, Dr. Chang will go over some of uh, that as well in her part of the discussion. As far as the, as the results, you do get in some immediate results uh, at the time of the colonoscopy. Um, you will speak with you as well as uh, whomever you elect to drive you to the procedure to tell you about if we found polyps, number one, and if we did, uh, the approximate size, um, if there's any concerning features, et cetera. Um, now, that being said, there are different types of polyps. So when we remove the polyps, we send it off to the lab. They look at it under, under the microscope, and then we can get a better sense of you know, when we should do the next colonoscopy. <clears throat> Now, as far as uh, alternative testing for colorectal cancer, uh, there are stool tests. Now, you may have heard from uh, primary care physicians or other physicians, there are tests to look for microscopic amounts of blood in the stool. There's a few different ways to do that. You don't necessarily need to, uh, you don't necessarily need to worry about the names, just so that you've heard them before. Um, one is called a guaiac test, and another is called a FIT test. Um, however, in 2014, the FDA approved a new type of test. It's a multi-target stool test. Uh, and it detects antibodies to blood as well as altered DNA in the stool. Now, you may wonder, how are you detecting DNA in the stool? Uh, well, the DNA is shed from cells in the intestinal lining and passed into the stool. Uh, and it's a kit that is actually mailed to your house. You collect the specimen and mail it back. So there, uh, that's one of the big advantages of, the st of stool testing. Uh, some of the numbers, uh, it detects about 92% of cancers. However, it was negative in about 87% of patients uh, without colon cancer or advanced, advanced polyps. Uh, so again, there are pros and cons. The pro is that it's non-invasive and it can be done at home. However, it does have a higher miss rate than colonoscopies. And uh, another difference with the stool test compared to a colonoscopy, if it is negative, and it's, uh, it needs to be repeated in three years. Another option, some patients like to choose is something called, uh, used to be referred to as a virtual colonoscopy, but essentially is something called a CT colonography. And that's a radiology uh, study uh, done with CAT scan imaging. And it is approved as a screening method. Uh, it detects about 80 to 90% of polyps greater than a centimeter. However, one of the drawbacks is that there are, as I mentioned, different types of polyps, different shapes of polyps, so they are, they're do exist something called flat polyps, and those are less apt to be detected by this method. Uh, this is technically minimally invasive since it is a radiology study. However, during the exam, you do have to have air or gas inserted into the colon to blow it up like a balloon so that the radiologist can see the walls of the colon where the polyps live. So, uh, they do put the tube in the rectum, insert some air gas, so it is minimally um, uncomfortable. Um, <clears throat> there is also a prep for the CT colonography as well, and the, there is a shorter interval of screening compared to uh, colonoscopy. Now, just a quick summary slide comparing the three methods I discussed. Uh, one, I mentioned the colonoscopy, which is considered the gold standard, can remove polyps at the same time uh, as the, of the exam, it is safe and it is painless. The stool testing, uh, multi-target uh, stool testing like Cologuard is non-invasive and can be done at home. There's no prep, however, if it is abnormal, it will, it will require a colonoscopy, uh, as would a CT scan. Uh, some of the other things to note about CT scans are that they are minimally invasive, as I mentioned. There's radiation involved. And another uh, potential drawback is that there may be incidental findings found in a CAT scan which may require further testing, which again may or may not be significant. Now, when to screen? This is a, certainly a big question nowadays over the last year or so. Um, you know, the first, 
the first important distinction to make is whether a patient is average risk or high risk. Um, easiest thing to do is talk about high risk patients and then everyone who is not considered high risk would fall under an average risk classification. Uh, high risk patients are uh, patients with a family history of colon cancer or colon polyps, uh, underlying genetic syndromes or types of inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Now, there are specific criteria in the guidelines regarding what constitutes a, sp a strong family history. I won't necessarily get too bogged down in details, but the important thing to note is that these patients should be screened sooner and more often. Uh, just to give you an example, though, you know, if a, there's a first degree relative who's younger than 60, then that patient should have a colonoscopy um, either at age 40 or 10 years before that relative's time of diagnosis, so whichever comes first. Now, again, as far as when to screen, for as long as I can remember, the screening recommendations had been age 50. Um, however, there are some new data, which we'll get to in our next uh, slide as well. Um, there are specific populations, even going back 10 plus years, um, there are data to suggest that African Americans diagnosed with colon colorectal cancer at a younger age than others, other populations. And so their recommendation uh, had been age 45. Now, Last year, the American Cancer Society came out with new guidelines and recommendations to screen uh, all patients at age 45 for colorectal cancer. <clears throat> now, the reasons behind this change, uh, the biggest um, thing to note here is on this figure, as you can see, it's colorectal cancer cases uh, per 100,000 persons, age 20 to 49. As you can see, over the last decade or, or two, the incidence is increasing in younger and younger uh, people. Um, now there is, that sort of discusses the disease burden. The other reasons behind the change is that the screening exams really work. Um, and there are choices that patients can make. Um, we don't necessarily believe that everybody wants to have a colonoscopy, so if they choose another screening method, then that's perfectly reasonable. But our, our goal is that everyone gets screened in some way, shape, or form for colon cancer. Um, the procedures themselves are all low risk. And there's a great potential benefit to individuals as well. Now, when to stop screening, you know, I like the traffic light uh, analogy uh, that the USPSTF uses. Um, ages 45 to 75, typically we'll say green, so go ahead and screen. Um, ages 76 to 85, you know, we'll interpret that with caution. It's a very personalized discussion with the patient. Also, there's a discussion whether the, whether the expected life expectancy is more than 10 years. Uh, and that's why it's an individualized decision in that 10-year frame uh, time frame. And after age 85, we say, you know, red light, we, we do not uh, recommend routine screening for colon cancer at that time. And finally, when we talk about risk factors for colon pops and colon cancer, you know, there are some that patients can change, but there are others that they cannot. Uh, it's important to note that patients can still get polyps without any of these risk factors. Now, the two most important, uh, you can't change uh, age or family history. Um, I guess you could tell someone you're younger, but your colon would know it. Um, and uh, some of the other risk factors include uh, physical activity, uh, dietary factors, smoking, obesity, uh, alcohol use, and sort of red or processed meats. So here are a couple of references, uh, but more importantly, I think here are some resources for, for those um, viewing us on Facebook Live. Um, you can go to cancer.org, patients.gi.org, or cdc.gov uh, and search for colorectal cancer. Um, but here are the direct links if, if you would uh, choose to do so. If you have any questions uh, for me, certainly feel free to contact uh, me. Again, here is our website. Um, MikeNV.org, and here's a, a phone number, 703-698-8960. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Chang, uh, and she'll focus uh, on the man surgical management of colon cancer.
Hi, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sardano, for that great talk on uh, screening and guidelines and colonoscopy. I'm going to be switching gears a little bit and talking about colorectal surgery, um, the different techniques, um, the options that we have for treatment, and also uh, the recovery after surgery. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I'm originally from New Jersey, and that's where I did my medical school training and my residency. After I completed my residency, I moved to Seattle where I did my colorectal surgery fellowship um, at Swedish Medical Center. And then last year I moved here to Virginia uh, where I joined Fairfax Colon and Rectal Surgery. And I'm happy to be here uh, also in the ANOVA family. So the objectives of my talk today, I'm gonna to talk about when surgery is indicated, the advances in surgery, the past, present, and the future, and then the advances that we've had in perioperative care and recovery. So when is surgery indicated? Um, and Dr. Sardana touched on this a little bit. Um, so when you have a colonoscopy and a large polyp is found, a polyp that's too large to be removed uh, by colonoscopy. And then of course, when cancer is found. Um, when a large polyp or if a large tumor or cancer is found, then what is typically done by the endoscopist is uh, the area is tattooed, and you can see here there's tattoo markings um, on the inside of the colon wall. And so this guides the surgeon to tell them where exactly the tumor is when they're planning, uh, when they go into the operating room. And you can see the, the tattoo marking, oh, sorry, on the outside here. So before moving straight to surgery after a diagnosis is made, um, first you must rule out any distant spread of the cancer, or also known as metastasis. Uh, some people have, may have heard of this as stage four cancer, and in colorectal cancer, it typically spreads to the liver or the lung. And so the first thing that's done is a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, pelvis is ordered to just rule out that the disease hasn't gone anywhere else. Once that's done, then we, we, then we can proceed with surgical planning. Um, then when it comes to uh, further staging of the cancer, um, after the resection is done, then the pathologist will evaluate the specimen and look at the tumor characteristics. So they'll look at the depth of invasion, um, how far does the colon invade into the colon wall. And then also they'll look at the lymph nodes. They'll look at number of lymph nodes that have cancer cells within it. Now, in terms of the types of operations, so in the past, everyone got what we call open surgery. So big, big incisions, big incisions and big scars. And now this is still a method that's used to perform surgery today um, in special circumstances, but at one time, this was really the only way. At present, we have minimally invasive surgery. So laparoscopy um, was first introduced in the 1980s, and then robotic surgery more recently uh, became in use uh, starting in the early 2000s. And both approaches use small keyhole incisions, and as you can see in this photo on the right, small scars and small incisions. So what are the advantages of laparoscopy? We have smaller incisions, so you have less pain. You have smaller scars, and so improved cosmesis. And then there's also less risk of wound infections. Because you have smaller incisions, you have less use of narcotic pain medication, which is constipating. And so therefore, you have quicker return of bowel function. Some other advantages. Uh, while we don't quite know and understand the exact mechanisms behind this, but we do know that in laparoscopy compared to open surgery, you have improved preservation of immune function in the patient. Also leads to shorter length of stay, shorter hospitalization, and therefore fewer complications. Complications such as blood clots, pneumonia, um, wound infections, and other things. Well, there are disadvantages of laparoscopy. Um, for one, it's, it's certainly difficult to learn. 
um, uh, there's no depth perception. So the surgeon is viewing the inside of the abdomen on a 2D monitor, so just like a television screen. So they really don't have depth perception. The movements can be a little bit unnatural, and so it can be difficult to suture and to uh, perform fine movements. Uh, this is a picture here of one, one type of laparoscopic instrument. As you can see, there's a handle, there's a very long end, and then the instrument uh, handle is uh, at the very end of it. And it only moves in one direction, it opens and closes. Um, also, as a surgeon, uh, you need to have an assistant with you in the operating room, someone to hold the camera. Um, and this person who's holding the camera can have uh, variable experience with uh, you know, stability, and so you can have some inconsistency with that, and that can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, for both the surgeon and the assistant, it's just poor ergonomics sometimes. You know, you're holding instruments at various angles, twisting and turning your body, and so because of the poor posture, this leads to some increased fatigue. So in response to these challenges and disadvantages of laparoscopy, out came robotic surgery. And so the advantages of a robotic surgery is that you have a 3D high definition vision. Um, picture is not showing up. Um, all right, the pictures are just not coming out for some reason. Not going to the next slide either. Thank you. Okay, so I was saying um, the surgeon has 3D high definition vision. So the surgeon's sitting at a console next to the patient. Um, and through this console, they're able to view everything in three dimensions. Additionally, oops, sorry. The instruments are very advanced. They move like the wrist of a hand. So they have full, uh, uh, full wristed ability to make fine dissections and to also precisely suture inside the abdomen. Now the issue with the camera in laparoscopy, so the camera is attached, it's oh, not what I wanted. Oh, okay. We'll just ignore that. Um, but the camera is attached to one of the robotic arms, and so the surgeon has complete control of that camera. And so it's very stable. Also, they're able to get into very small spaces like the pelvis. Um, this is particularly important in colorectal surgery, particularly with rectal cancer. And ultimately, surgeon ergonomics are just much better. The surgeon is sitting at the console, much more comfortable, much less fatigue. So another advancement in robotic surgery is a technology called endocyanine green imaging. Now this is a technology that's utilized to assess blood flow and tissue perfusion during the operation. Adequate tissue perfusion and blood flow is very critical and important in colorectal surgery. When you remove a part of the colon, you usually wanna put things back together. And so when you're putting things back together, that anastomosis or that connection relies on adequate blood flow. And so ICG is this medical dye that's injected into the bloodstream by the anesthesiologist during the surgery. And when it's injected, these particles attach to the proteins in the bloodstream. And then when the surgeon who's at the console is able to turn on a fluorescent light, so this is the normal view with just the white light. And when he turns on the fluorescent light, you can then see that the perfused areas then light up green. So now the surgeon's able to distinguish exactly where the demarcation is between perfusion and non-perfusion. And so in this case, this would be the area in which the surgeon should make the resection. 
Another advancement is uh, in transanal surgery. Now this can be done either laparoscopically or robotically. And this is when a single port is inserted into the anal canal and the instruments are then inserted through the single port and this is used to remove uh, small or early rectal tumors. So this can be done basically without any visible scars on the outside. So where's the future of surgery going? And there's tons of advancements being made. A lot of companies are out there with um, you know, a lot of great minds trying to think of how to improve upon surgery. In advancements in instrumentation and technology, new stapling devices, new energy devices. Right now, there's basically one main robotic platform that's used across the country. But we know that in the coming years, there are a few companies coming out with new robotic platforms that probably will have features to compete with the one that's currently out. We also need to have continued research on patient outcomes. With all the advanced technology, we need to make sure that this actually benefits the patient. And also what's important is continued improvements in patient recovery protocols. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that next. Enhanced recovery after surgery, also known as ERAS. Now this is probably the biggest advancement in the past decade in surgical recovery. And it's basically protocols that are used to improve patient outcomes and improve patient recovery after a major operation. So it encompasses multimodal techniques that occur before, during, and after surgery to ultimately benefit the patient. So some examples, so pre-surgery, things like counseling, nutritional optimization. Back in the day, we used to have the patient have fast starting at midnight and then have nothing to eat or drink until their surgery. Even if their surgery was at three or four in the afternoon, they're basically fasting the entire time. But we now know that that's actually detriment to the patient. So what we do now is we have the patient drink a carbohydrate drink four hours before surgery. And this prevents the consequences of prolonged fasting. They have earlier return of bowel function. They aren't um, have swings of their glucose levels in their bloodstream. And so this definitely is one of the things that we utilize uh, preoperatively. Other things are preoperative antibiotics, um, blood thinners to prevent wound infections and to prevent blood clots. During surgery, as I just talked about, minimally invasive surgical techniques. Um, also improvements in fluid management by our anesthesiology colleagues. And after surgery, the emphasis is on early mobilization, multimodal pain control with non-narcotic pain medications, so you don't have the constipating effects of a lot of narcotics. And this leads to quicker return of bowel function. Also, we feed the patients very soon after surgery. We used to have the patients not eat any food until they passed gas, but now we start them immediately on clear liquids. As long as they're not nauseated, we let them eat food. So the benefits, better pain control, less narcotic use, earlier mobilization, earlier return to a normal diet, earlier release from the hospital, and fewer complications. All of this leading to a faster return to activities, normal work, and decreasing the pain of surgery, and ultimately satisfied and happier patients. So with that, I end my talk. I want to thank you for your attention and your time, and Dr. Sardana will join me and will take any questions that anybody might have. Get copies of the slides. Um, is there a place where we can make them? Or how?
questions here from the online uh, virtual audience. I was diagnosed with stage three rectal cancer at age 35. What age should I have my daughter screened? So it would be, it would be age 25. Yeah, so age 30, you said, I'm sorry, age 35? Uh, yes, this is a question from online. And sh uh, question is, I was diagnosed with stage three rectal cancer at 35. What age should I have my daughter screen? Yeah, I would recommend age 25 and I would also potentially even recommend some genetic counseling so uh, to make sure and sometimes you know when they remove the tumor they can also tell if there's any uh, potential mutations as well so uh, genetic counseling would be important there. Okay. This one is pretty similar. At what age do you recommend screening if colon cancer is in the family, like maternal gr grandmother? Yeah, so second degree relative is a little bit different in terms of screening. So those um, technically, technically don't fall under the guidelines, but so age 45 would typically be, be sufficient. However, a first degree relative uh, at any age, you would start screening earlier. Or if there's two first degree relatives at any age, again, you would, you would start earlier. I read that colon cancer is rising for those under the age of 50. Can you talk about why that's, what, what's contributing to that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, don't, we don't know definitively, but some of the uh, risk factors that we talked about, uh, obesity, tobacco smoking, alcohol, I think those are some of the large, large factors, um, certainly dietary changes. Uh, we don't have a definitive cause at this point, but but certainly the data is there that it's increasing, and that's that's a large part uh, large part of the reason that the American Cancer Society did recommend decreasing the age of screening down to age 45. What is the problem with the polyps? It seems like a lot of people may have them and not even know. Are they necessarily problematic? So, so that's a great question. There are different types of polyps. So there are some polyps that certainly have zero malignant uh, risk or zero risk to turn into cancer. However, 20 to 30% of people over the age of 50 have something called adenomatous polyps. And those are the types of polyps that we're looking for. Those are the types of polyps that uh, do run the risk to turn into cancer. And as you mentioned, and as I mentioned during the talk as well, unfortunately polyps don't cause symptoms. So we don't really know um, if people have them. And again, they are fairly common between 20 and 30 percent of people having polyps over the age of 50. Can anyone who needs surgery opt for a robotic surgery instead of a traditional? And what is the percentage of patients receiving robotic surgery versus traditional methods? So it's very institutional based. Um, a lot of it just depends on the experience of the surgeon, uh, the surgeons at the hospital that you go to. Um, robotic surgery in colorectal surgery certainly is a newer advancement uh, within the past decade. And so there are going to be a lot of surgeons out there who are not trained in robotic surgery although a lot of them are being trained um, actively. And um, so it really just depends on the experience. Um, the same type of procedure can be done well and efficiently and without complications laparoscopically as well, you know, with a well-trained laparoscopic surgeon. So, you know, right now the data on robotic surgery versus laparoscopic surgery is still coming out and that's because it's uh, you know fair, relatively new uh, technology and so all of the data is not quite out there yet but um, you know you don't have to have it done robotically but you know if you happen to find a surgeon who is well trained in it and feels that you are a good candidate for that procedure then I think it would be um, a safe option. My mother just died from rectal cancer at the age of 77. She was diagnosed in 2017 with a six pound tumor. And the surgeon said the term tumor had been there for at least five to seven years, making my mother about 70 years old when the tumor began to grow. I'm 49 years old. Should I be tested now or wait until I'm 50? 
So it's, um, first of all, you know, I'm sorry for, for that, uh, for your loss there. I know it can be difficult. Uh, I think all of us have, have known some uh, friend or family member with a uh, similar story. So, you know, that is disheartening, of course. Um, I would recommend getting screening now. Um, the screening recommendations do say that even if a family member is above the age of 50, uh, at time of diagnosis for colon cancer to start as early as 40. Very good. Um, what, would there be a problem for someone with a pacemaker having a colonoscopy? So that's a, another great question. No, we have, uh, we have done colonoscopies on patients with pacemakers, defibrillators, uh, you know, other medical devices, LVADs, et cetera. Um, and they, we are able to accommodate. Typically, the biggest, there are a few differences, I guess. One would be typically we would do these potentially higher risk patients at the hospital, in a hospital setting. Uh, where anesthesiologists are, are better able and have more um, equipment to deal with any potential issues that may come up. We'd all, also have cardiologists cardiologist on staff if needed. Um, so that would be one difference. Number two, if there's any um, uh, different devices we would use, we uh, would use them with caution in someone with a, a pacemaker or a defibrillator. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, at home we got this a couple times about at home kits versus the traditional colonoscopy. Yeah, so it's a great question. At the at home kits, uh, the one most commonly used is something called a Cologuard, and that's what um, you know I brought up earlier. Something called a multi-target idea uh, stool testing. It tests both for blood uh, as well as for stool DNA. Uh, and so it is a good test to screen patients for colon cancer. About 92% of patients with colon cancer will have a positive test. Now on the flip side, again, unfortunately, there are 8% 8 8 of patients uh, with colon cancer who have a negative test. So it's not perfect, although it is very good. Um, and so, again, it, our, our goal and, you know, part of the reason I went into GI is, or gastroenterology uh, is because preventative care is important to me. And so it is... Uh, if that is the only way that uh, someone feels comfortable being screened as an uh, initial test, then I'm all for it, um, just as long as they get screened. Very helpful. Okay. Yes, hi. Um, I have um, an inguinal hernia, and it has not been repaired. And whenever I get gassy, the area bulges out and has to be reduced. Is this going to affect the ability to tolerate a colonoscopy? Like when you put gas in there, is it going to aggravate the hernia? It's a good question. So, uh, typ question. Typically, no. Uh, typically, we, we have done colonoscopies on patients with inguinal hernias. And again, depending on size, we you know, certainly uh, exam, examine things beforehand. But in, in most scenarios, no. I've heard on the internet that home tests like Cologuard can can generate a rate of false positive. Is that true? So that is, that is true. Um, you know, there are some patients with positive that end up having colonoscopy and it is negative. So 80, 87% is sort of the number that's uh, thrown out there. Um, now, uh, I'm glad you brought up the Cologuard again because uh, I don't think that I mentioned this earlier. Um, Another important thing to note about the Cologuard is that it, it should not be done on patients with symptoms. So Cologuard, again, is a screening test or screening um, exam. Um, so symptoms would then lead us towards doing uh, something, called, with a, something called a diagnostic colonoscopy, which is functionally the same thing. However, again, there's a whole host of other possibilities. Uh, again, the Cologuard is just a screening test. If uh, if I were to have colorectal surgery, uh, after the surgery, would I be able to return to being managed by my PCP, or would I have to follow up with a colorectal surgeon or a GI doctor after that? What's the post-operative management? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so immediately after surgery, usually a surgeon will want to see the patient back in the office for a post-operative check check the wounds, see how they're doing as far as, you know, their energy levels, their activity, and their diet. Usually that 
visit is anywhere from two to three weeks after surgery. So that's the first initial visit. Now, if the patient had surgery specifically for colorectal cancer, then typically, and it might vary a little bit, um, you know, depending on the practice, but the way that our practice works is that we have the, every patient with colorectal cancer see a medical oncologist afterwards. For one, they may end up requiring chemotherapy depending on the stage of the cancer, meaning if there was cancer cells found in the lymph nodes, then usually the recommendation is for that patient to have chemo, so they would need to then see an oncologist anyway. But then, even if they didn't need chemotherapy, the patient will then follow up with an oncologist and have blood work drawn every several months uh, for a number of years. Um, there's also criteria in terms of a follow-up CAT scan, checking for recurrence, um, and then also a repeat colonoscopy uh, one year after uh, the surgery is done to, again, check for recurrence of the cancer. Um, as far as continued follow-up with the surgeon, um, again, it's a little variable. Uh, we see the patient certainly for any surgical issues um, after their surgery, um, but the main one is going to be immediately after the operation, about two to three weeks later. If, if I have colorectal surgery, how long would I have to be in the hospital? That's also a great question. So the average stay is anywhere from two to five days. Um, a lot of it just depends on the patient and how well they recover immediately after surgery. The criteria that we use for discharge uh, from the hospital is that you are walking around without any issues, so your pain is pretty well controlled, that you have some return of bowel function, and usually that's just the passing of gas. We don't wait for bowel movement. Um, and then also just uh, not having any nausea or vomiting with eating, that you're tolerating a regular diet. So once those criteria are met, then we find the patient safe to go home. And again, it's usually anywhere from two to five days. Uh, one last question. Um... I know you talk a lot about pre-existing conditions and those being indicators for earlier um, colonoscopy. Uh, I'm type 1 diabetic, and I know that sometimes diabetes gets lumped all in together. Are there differences between the indications for type 1 or type 2, and would it be recommended for me to come in for a colonoscopy and get screened prior to that 45 uh, recommend age 45 recommendation? Okay, uh, so currently there are no guidelines to distinguish uh, diabetes from your average risk patient as far as timing for uh, screening colonoscopy. Um, so my recommendation would be to proceed at age 45. Uh, Dr. Sardana, Dr. Chang, uh, I don't believe we have any further questions this evening. Uh, we just really want to thank you again for your time. This has been really great. Um, thank you so much, and uh, we hope to be able to work with you all more in the future. Right. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. We appreciate it.